Hello, so I'm Dave Robinson from DataCamp. I'm gonna be talking about why you should teach the tidyverse to beginners. This is a topic I've talked a lot about before on my blog, Variance Explained. You can see a couple of posts starting in 2014 uh, recommending that people teach beginners ggplot2 rather than built-in R plotting. In 2016, I shared more about why I use ggplot2 and then spread my belief that um, really it applies to all the tidyverse, dplyr, ggplot2, tidyr, and the rest of the ecosystem. And I bet you're wondering whether this talk applies to you. And so it's worth clarifying what do I mean by teaching? So who here would consider themselves a teacher of R? It's a great crowd, and I think um, a lot of us would imagine we're thinking of lecturing students. So there's some, uh, certainly there's some college professors or high school teachers or people that um, teach R here uh, to beginners. But I'm also referring to uh, a lot of other ways that you can make the choice of what to teach. So for example, you might be evangelizing to coworkers. So I do a lot of this is when, when I was working at Stack Overflow or at Data Camp, try and figure, figure out how can we onboard new people into R. And it might be in public speaking or advocacy, like here Lisa Simpson telling everyone they should use ggplot2. It might be the kind of thing where we are um, doing a blog post and analysis that we want to get people into data science and we understand how do we get them in. So teaching is not just for professional teachers. So I'll share how I recommend teaching R, and then I'll go into the why. So if, I, if the uh, fire alarm went off right now and I had to leave, I'd be happy as long as I got this one slide in. Have goals for what you want your students to do and start them doing it as early as possible. And that sounds like it's um, kind of general, but it has some very specific implications. One is that order matters. You can't just say, well, I plan to teach all these things in the course, so I'll teach this early, I'll teach this later. You should put a lot of thought into what the, someone's first impression of R is. And it also means that when you teach some, something, you should show why it's useful immediately, not later on. So my goal when I try and get people to use R is I want people to understand their data. And this is a workflow of the tidyverse um, way of working through what kinds of things you might want to do with data to import, to tidy, transform, visualize, model, and then uh, communicate the results. And largely the set of tidyverse tools are very well suited for each of these steps. So uh, my way of teaching R is kind of encapsulated in my data camp course, Introduction to the Tidyverse. So if you go to DataCamp and try taking this course, it has, uh, it's intended for people that have never used R or even programmed before. And it has four chapters. First teaching, data wrangling. How can you take data and uh, do what you need to tidy it and bring it into an analysis? It has data visualization with ggplot2. It moves on to grouping and summarizing. So steps you might do after you've tidied your data, but then you can go back to visualization. And, um, and do, show it in other kinds of ways. So as su I said, these are the things I want students to do. Let's give them a few tools that allow them to do it. I have a follow-up more advanced course called Exploratory Data Analysis in R Case Study. And that's meant for people that already have some experience with R and with dplyr. But it's, I take a very similar approach of I teach people to clean and, and, and transform a data set, to visualize it, to model it using my broom package, which works very well with dplyr and ggplot2, and then to join and tidy that data with, um, with other data sets. So all these courses, this is generally how I really like thinking. I think about the kinds of package, the kinds of parts of an analysis that students would want to do, and I match the, the packages to those problems. So why is the tidyverse so well suited? Well, consider that it's powerful. People in a couple lines of code can get a lot of output. This is a graph from my first course. So it's something that we can, we don't have to say, oh, and you'll learn in week one, learn in week two, learn in week three. On the last day, you'll understand something from your data. Here, for example, students are able to understand a relationship in country demographics in just a couple of lines of code in the first hour of using R. And it's also consistent. So the, G the tidyverse was largely set up, so all the pieces work together, and it works according to a consistent philosophy, so people don't have to deal with lots of, um, of memorizing little fiddly details. 
This is one example that I was kind of really um, excited to see. The FS package is a, um, is a one package within the tidyverse that works with file system operations. And there already are tools in, fi in the file system that, um, in, in R for working with the file system but they use different naming conventions because they were added at different times by different people. Lowercase path.expand, or camel case normalize path, or capitalize sys.chmod, or file.access. And these are really difficult for students because every time they learn something, they have to shift their method of thinking, and it's very hard to memorize them. So the tidyverse has been really well set up for beginners to get onboarded onto it because it uses consistent syntax. So anytime we choose what to teach first, we have to choose what to leave until later. And here there's some things that people might consider really important parts of R that we don't get to early in a course. So one example is data structures. Um, neither of these courses talks about what a factor is, how to, uh, how to create a matrix, or even what a list is. Almost everything is done on data frames and, at and atomic vectors. It doesn't introduce loops. So this is an example of, say, a, um, a for loop, and none of the courses work with that because they can often be replaced by a group by and a summarize. We don't teach conditionals. These are considered, an, and they, they properly are, a fundamental unit of programming, um, but it's not included within how we might deal with data in the tidyverse. And we don't even necessarily introduce users to, uh, def for defining their own functions. There are some contexts where it's um, useful, but it's, none of these courses would discuss something like that. So these are the kinds of code you might recognize from maybe your introductory um, R course or your introductory programming course. Uh, some like basic examples of how can we do an if and how can we create a function that adds three to a number. So we probably take these kinds of code examples for granted. But take a look at them. They're all useless. They're not doing anything. This is looping through and it's printing uh, numbers from th uh, three through 13, so three through 12. This is a function to add three to a number. Why would I need that as opposed to adding three? Here's an if conditional that is printing something. When we introduce these units of programming, uh, we have to avoid these kinds of examples that aren't alongside an actual useful example. So I think where is a good place that we can show these, um, include these in a curriculum? I think R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grolleman is a really good example of an ordering of how things can be taught in R. So here there's about 30 chapters of an introduction to R. Um, this is all available online, really terrific book. And notice that um, introducing, that writing someone's own functions is introduced in chapter 19. And iteration with uh, loops and I believe conditionals as well is introduced in chapter 21. So everyone knows students do need to learn these, but they didn't have to be the first things. Notice they started with, the, with data visualization, data wrangling, how you tidy data. So why do people teach these kinds of uh, approaches first? Why do people feel like we should teach if and for loops? So who's seen the movie Karate Kid? So in Karate Kid, there, I think a lot of people kind of model themselves off this teacher, Mr. Miyagi from Karate Kid. If you haven't seen the movie, this is where he um, is having his student, Daniel, he's having him um, wax his car and paint his house and do these other meaningless chores. And then Daniel finally gets really angry about it, and it's only later that he realizes that the whole time he's been learning karate without even knowing it. So I think a lot of people think, um, think of, of teaching R that they'll do something similar. They'll teach a for loop that doesn't actually do anything useful. But then later when the student needs it, they'll realize that they've been learning powerful methods all along. So I don't like this approach. I think that Mr. Miyagi really was kind of doing Daniel a disservice. Because uh, as I said, my philosophy would be, start people doing uh, your goals as early as possible. So when, so when a beginner walks into a class, what might they be want, want to learn? So typically someone might be in the crowd and say, um, well, I want to draw conclusions about my gene expression data set. Or maybe they have a, a psychology experiment they need to interpret the results. Maybe they have an internship coming up. They'd like to analyze data for their job. So these are the kinds of goals that students are going to walk in and they're, they're ready to put in the work to learn these things. 
What aren't they thinking? They're probably not thinking, well, I really want to hear what a loop is. I've heard so much about them. <laughs> They're probably not thinking, I need to know the six types of atomic vectors. No one's going in and saying, if, I don't, if they don't talk about function scoping, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> so if you're teaching these things really early on, you're losing students' attention. And, and if you structure your course like this, where you say more progress, um, uh, as more progress happens, you can um, start off going slow, but later it all comes together into something that students can do. You're kind of starting with uh, people saying, well, why would I need this? And later on telling them, oh, I get it now. If that sounds like it works, consider, what if they quit right here? I mentioned that of the kinds of teaching um, you might do, working with coworkers or public advocacy in a blog post, a lot of them have non-captive audiences. Nothing's stopping them from quitting. They're busy people, they've got jobs to do, and they're not necessarily going to stay to wait until it all comes together. A better path might be that the further progress you make in the course, the more students can do in a linear trend. So people are always gaining more and more power. In fact, you can probably, if you're a little bit clever, structure your course so it's a bit front-loaded, where you can kind of follow the 80-20 rule. Solve 80% of students' problems as early as you can, and then start getting into the details of other things they might need to do later in the course. So I've sometimes heard the, the criticism that perhaps tidyverse is training wheels. It's very good for beginners, but how far can people really get just using the tidyverse? To that I'd respond that Julia Silge and I wrote a book, Text Mining with R, and the, um, the entire thing goes through many examples of exploring, visualizing, and modeling text data, and the whole book doesn't use a single loop or conditional. We weren't trying to avoid it. It's just that you can get a huge amount done with the tools in the, in the tidyverse. So there are exceptions to rules like this. This really isn't, a, um, isn't an absolute. And I think there are a few good examples of when you shouldn't teach the tidyverse first. One would be if your core, um, it's really about what your goals are. So I mentioned before, my goal generally would be get people understanding and analyzing data. But you might have a different goal. One goal your students could have is they want to learn to program. Maybe they wa want to build their own R packages. And, um, and then you might really want to learn things, the fundamentals of programming, they can apply them to other languages. For that, I'd, I'd, um, it's a very reasonable goal, but I'd ask two questions. One is, why are you choosing R? R isn't necessarily the best first language to, to learn if, someone, if you want to teach programming fundamentals because it's usually used for one particular domain, understanding data, and because it ha there are some things in other languages like for loops that can be very bad habits in R because of the way that the language is designed. Another is, are you sure that students are as interested in writing and publishing packages as you think that they are? So this is a crowd of very committed people that have all really been a, um, is really quite selective people that care a lot about R. We're here on a Saturday. Can you raise your hand if you've ever submitted a package to CRAN? So consider that, even in a crowd like this, most people don't feel the need to write their own packages or to publish them. So sometimes teachers will start and say, well, I think everyone's gonna wanna build code other people can use. Maybe they don't. Maybe they want to understand their own data. Another goal could be mathematical understanding. So if you want to, learn to teach things like PCA, you want to teach um, eigenspaces, you want to teach things about how people can, um, uh, can really model and, and do statistical understanding of data from a mathematical approach, the tidyverse may not be the right start. The philosophy is still true. You'd want to teach things, as, um, have the goals, and teach them as early as you can. You'd probably start by teaching matrices before teaching data frames. You'd probably teach linear algebra before you teach the methods of relational algebra, that being group by and um, joins and really kind of SQL syntax that dplyr imitates. So really you can see it's described by a different kind of vocabulary. And here's a case where you might want to teach the abstract before the concrete because the abstract is what you actually want the students to understand. If you are picking a case study, it might really be secondary and might not reflect what, the, um, what goals you're hoping to get across in the students. So I think if you're aiming to teach programming or aiming to teach math and you're sure that's your goal, those are some valid reasons not to teach the tidyverse first. 
So what's next for me this year is in January I joined Data Camp, and here we have a really terrific set of data about how people learn. So I'd like to, I've been planning some um, work to get evidence behind this and get a really good understanding of how people can actually learn R, what kinds of mistakes they make, and how we can help students through it, leading to a process we're calling data-driven curriculum development. I look forward to talking a lot about that this year. And if you want your team to learn the tidyverse, if you want to kind of spread it um, and you think this is a good philosophy, a really good way to do that is Data Camp for Business. So we're sponsoring and we have Sam and Chris over there um, that are manning the Data Camp booth and you should absolutely talk to them. My course on tidyverse and exploratory data analysis, a ton of great people's courses like um, Max Kuhn has a course, Andreas Miller has a course. There's lots of material in terms of to get people to, um, uh, to learn and do things in um, in both R and Python, and it's a really good way to lead your team. So absolutely talk to the DataCab people afterwards about how we can help your team uh, with learning. And if you're interested in being an instructor and you want to teach data science to a huge audience of over 2 million registered users, you should go to datacamp.com slash create and apply to become an instructor. So um, this, I think, is a really good crowd for people that you might have something that you're an expert in and you might be able to communicate. Um, and I'd be really excited to talk to you about that afterwards. Thank you.